Well, one good thing about speaking in Southern California is I don't have to apologize for taking the water. <laughs> it's only something that you feel guilty about, um, well, or not. Um, anyway, I'm really glad to be here. I'm uh, very honored that you're, you all came out on this for Southern California chilly night uh, to come hear me. And I'm going to try to just give you some basic ideas about what, what's in the book, and then I'm really thrilled to get your questions. Uh, because I think I'm raising a lot of issues. You know, you start off with, you always ask the question, why am I doing this? Why am I writing this book? And I think more than anything else, I had been, for the last 20, 30 years, been following demographics pretty carefully. And in a book um, I co-authored in 1988, we looked at the issue of demographics in Europe and Japan and the United States uh, in a book basically about Asia, with my co-author was a Japanese woman, and we found something really interesting, which is that we started to see this tremendous divergence in the birth rates of the United States on one hand and Europe and Japan on another. And when the United States population passed 300 million several years ago, the Wall Street Journal and others were asking, asked me to write about it, and I became really taken with why is this happening and what does it mean? Um, and so I, that's basically what the book is about. Now, one of the things that's very critical to un understand is back in the 1960s, and all of you are too young to remember the 60s, um, that there was a belief, late 60s, early 70s, that, the, that humanity was in an absolute uh, steamroller towards disaster, that the, we were absolutely going to go through massive starvation. There was a book called The Population Bomb and many others around it, which were extraordinarily negative about the future of humanity. Um, and they often predicted that by the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there would be mass starvation on a global level. Um, and um, one of the people who was a supporter of this view, who happens to be the science advisor to the current president of the United States, uh, wrote in, I believe it was the mid-80s, that countries um, in, Far East, in the Far East would never, and, and, and in South Asia would never progress further because there wouldn't be enough energy and food for them to do so. Well, having spent a lot of time in China uh, back in the early 80s and following what's been going on since then, I think something happened. Uh, having just come back a, a few weeks ago from India, something's happening. So the world is not as bleak a place as has been often thought. And is, again, we're going through another phase of that. Now, that one part of that is global. And a lot of it is still based on population. Now, what seems to be happening with population internationally, and then I'll get to the specifics of the U.S. and its competitors, the, what seems to be happening globally is the growth rate has slowed considerably. As people, urbanized majority of people, live in cities, um, as women go into the workforce, as education increases, as people are doing things other than working on a farm, you begin to see a ratcheting down of birth rates in the developing countries. There are still some that have high birth rates, but those have come down. And if you go to a place like Mumbai or Mexico City, as I've been recently, their birth rates are not that much higher than they are in the United States. So we're going to have a very interesting and challenging four decades ahead of us. By about 2050, the birth rate seems to get to a point where our world population may not grow very much more beyond 9 billion. It's currently 6 billion. So there's a lot of challenge there. And, uh, but I do think that human beings will find a way to accommodate this, and we can discuss that later as well. Now, there's another phenomenon that has not been uh, written about as much until at least the last few years. And that is the fact that there is such a thing as too low a birth rate. We had had the usual assumption that, that if people stopped having children, that that was always a good thing. And on some level, perhaps it is. If you are one of these people who believes human beings are the AIDS of the earth or a, or a cancer, maybe you know, the quicker we are eradicated, the better. But if you don't happen to feel that way, there are some very serious issues in a society that has not enough children. And what we're seeing now is in Japan, in Russia, in most of the EU, uh, in South Korea, in Hong Kong, uh, in Singapore, 
the beginnings of what is a new phenomena in global history, which is the evolution of societies to being heavily aged and actually having more older people than young people. By 2050, Japan's population will not only be smaller, but it will be probably somewhere around uh, 35 to 40% over 65. We have no idea how societies will deal with this. We know we've had villages, uh, the, uh, rural villages in many countries where this has happened, uh, it doesn't bode all that terribly well. Uh, the um, Japanese, of course, have really recognized that there's a problem there. In the last presidential election, it's quite interesting. First time that the, the issue of fertility became, in recent history, that became a big issue. And both parties struggling to try to show who was going to do something about the birth rate. And it reminds me of my friend of mine, Bill Fry, who's a, a uh, demographer um, at Brookings. And Bill went to Japan and they said, I don't know, how do these Americans have all these kids? So I said to Bill, well, you know what, if they have to ask that question, they're in more trouble than I thought. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that the U.S. is going on a very divergent course in terms of its population. And although our population is aging, and because of, of, of the various social factors, we do have less of a birth rate than we might have had, let's say, in the 1950s, the U.S. population will probably grow between 2000 and 2050 to about 400 million. It could be more, it could be a little bit less, but since I probably won't be around here, you can't call me on it anyway. Um, but I think we are going to see some steady growth. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you take a look at workforce growth, which is the people going into school, people who are going to be in the workforce, people who are going to innovate, people who are going to have new ideas, basically the group starting at 15 going to 64, the growth rate in the United States will be about 40% by 2050 uh, from 2000. Uh, the growth rate in the EU, EU will be minus 25. Uh, in South Korea, I believe it's minus 31. Uh, Russia, it may be more than that. And in Japan, it will be over minus 40. So what you're basically beginning to see already today are the outlines. What this book in some ways is, is I can see what is happening at the current level and starting to imagine where does that take you in 20, 30, 40 years. And it's already clear, um, even after the economic crisis, which we so brilliantly helped cook up for the world, um, Nevertheless, many of our competitors are now doing worse than we are. And one of the factors is lack of a young workforce, lack of a kind of, excuse me, sort of civic energy that would have been very useful uh, in these times and will be more useful in the future. So what you see predominantly is the United States as a great outlier among the, the major industrialized countries. Even China, which now still has a huge surging workforce, will also begin to age. Um, by 2050, maybe there'll be as many as 400 million people in China over 65. They don't have much of a social security system. The other thing is that China has this other little problem that people tend to uh, ignore. There are about 23 million more eligible males of marrying age than females. Now, how did that happen? Well, Mao Zedong wanted to increase China's population, so he just said pump them out as fast as possible. This was going to make China a great power. Deng Xiaoping takes power and says, oh my God, we, can't, we got to do something. One child. Now here are the unintended consequences are very interesting. What happens with, with that policy is they begin to have screening. They can do a little uh, ultrasound, and if there's nothing between the legs, that means one thing, and if there's something between the legs, it probably means something else. In a culture which favors male over female, this has meant an enormous disequilibrium. So China is certainly going to have a major demographic problem. So if we go down the, the road and we look at the next 20, 30 years, demographically, the United States is not going to have a huge population explosion, but it will continue to have a better balance between young and old and obviously male and female. Um, might even have a little advantage in female because uh, many of the children being adopted, from, uh, particularly from China, are, are female as opposed to male. Um, so, uh, but fundamentally, you're going to have relatively young demographics. In many ways, this is very good for the country. It means innovation. It means uh, youthful energy, uh, the ability to reinvent the world to, uh, that really is unique to younger people. Um, it will mean 
a growing domestic market for U.S. Uh, companies. It will mean um, that the older people will have people who might actually keep Social Security halfway solvent. Uh, there may be young people that take care of older people when they need it later in life. Um, so this is an extraordinarily positive side of this. And people say to me, well, you really want 100 million more people? And, you know, first of all, I say, well, you know, I'm not responsible. I didn't get these people pregnant. You know, they're pregnant on their own. They, they didn't ask me. But the fact of the matter is, this is already happening. I mean, you would get close to 400 million if immigration was cut in half and we had a 20, 30 year recession. I don't think we will, because a recession will slow down birth rates. But, but I think that fundamentally, it's a, it's a positive thing if we make, uh, meet some challenges. And, and when you think about the negative side, the downside, the most important issue is what you would call upward mobility. Will there be jobs and wealth creation for this generation? And uh, those of you who are in college now know what it's like on the other side of, of, the, uh, of the college, that you know that there aren't a lot of jobs out there. That's going to be a big challenge. That's going to be the fundamental challenge of this society in the next 20, 30 years. It's a, so the young population is an opportunity to move forward, an opportunity for the United States to be uh, the preeminent country in the world still in 30 or 40 years, which I think is likely. On the other hand, there's a huge challenge in terms of our infrastructure investment, our education investment, in terms of what we need, need to do. Um, in terms of, of our industrial base, in terms of agriculture, great challenges. But we, what the book tries to do is say, here are the challenges that we have, and we have to look at them. And we have to understand that European society and Japanese society have fundamentally different problems. They, they, we cannot say, well, we're going to be just like Denmark. Well, can't just be like Denmark, and we can't be like Germany uh, if we wanted to be for some unknown reason. Um, because these societies are going to have different, very different situations. They're going to have fewer people, older people, small workforces, shrinking workforces, very different set of challenges. So on that level, I think the United States is well positioned, but we certainly need to take advantage of that situation and prepare for it. And that preparation could be many things. Certainly infrastructure is a huge part of it. Anyone who lives in California today knows how bad many of the roads are. I was in the Bay Area, driving from Petaluma, and I said, ah, I'll go through San Francisco. And the roads were in such bad shape, I, I was two weeks later in Mexico City and said, God, Mexico City roads seem to be better than California roads. Um, this is not good. Um, so there's much that has to be done. There's much that has to be done in the United States in dealing with particularly the, the issues of the working class and um, of those kids who are not going to go to four-year schools. Um, and probably shouldn't go to four-year schools. I don't think we need to shove everybody through four-year schools. I mean, you know, to get, have a kid go to a Cal State and get a degree in um, postmodernist English, uh, well, as we used to say in New York, that in a subway type token will get you a ride on the subway. I mean, it, it doesn't mean anything. You're just adding on debt. You're just, what we need to do is think about how we can get people in productive industries. When I speak to business groups, they never say, oh my God, if we only had some more PhDs in postmodernism, uh, that would solve our problems. 